So, following on from what Maitri Devi was saying yesterday about insight, just to recap a tiny bit, um, insight is to free us from the suffering that's caused by our ignorance. In other words, our distorted views. Views which fix and resist and grasp and refuse and ignore. I think I got all of those. And she talked about how the territory of insight, Vipassana, is deep and broad and varied and non-linear and somewhat mysterious and how it unfolds, how it embeds and integrates. How that's very different in different beings. So another way in which the Vipassana um, practices vary um, is in how conceptual or experiential they are. So you can almost think of it as being like a spectrum. At one end you've got highly conceptual, and the other end you've got <coughs> highly experiential. And then lots of things in between. So just to sort of lay out that territory a little bit, um, starting from the experiential end, um, so looking at our experience in this moment, maybe asking a question, and that might be a, an unanswerable question. So this is very much the territory of the koan, and of the kind of practice that we did with my three days yesterday. We're looking, asking that question, where is this experience happening? Is there a boundary? And she was saying how it's not important to have an answer. What's important is the, the process. It's almost like we're trying to live the question or be the question mark um, and allow that to open something, to free something up, um, free us up from thinking that we know from that fixity. Create a space in the mind. And also on the experiential end, there are practices where we're looking at our moment-to-moment -moment experience, but we're kind of applying a particular lens. We're looking for something in particular. We're tuning our antennae to some particular aspect of experience, usually something that's getting ignored most of the time, that's obvious but being ignored. A kind of classic example of this would be noticing impermanence. So you can take a practice like the mindfulness of breathing, very simply make it an insight practice by particularly noticing how the breath, moment to moment, constantly changing. Or in the metta, cultivating metta through noticing what, what liberates the heart, what blocks the heart, the conditions, but then slightly turning the attention more to the seeing of that conditionality just watching it unfold. And um, oh, and seeing that there's nothing fixed there in this heart mind. And that it's all that it's co arising with the body. I think that seeing there's nothing fixed, um, I think I was saying that it can be really good to do that in the midst of just in, in the midst of something that we're really, that's really difficult, that we're really quite locked into. Very challenging, of course, the impulse is just to hold on. But if we can manage to do that in the midst of the Dukkha storm, open in the body, 
then we can really see there's nothing fixed. Everything can, is changing, can change, and dependence on conditions. So sometimes when we do this um, tuning our antennae to a particular aspect of experience, um, it might need to rest on prior reflection. So, for example, the suggestion that when the distraction arises, we just label it conditioned or not me and mine. Or another one in the same territory is just life unfolding. We're all all wired up differently and different words have different resonances. We can play and see which one is helpful. But um, we might need to reflect on that previously to just get really clear what that means, this condition that means. It's just life unfolding. That means it's not me and mine. And then we can just drop in that word. Looking at our experience, we drop in that word. We apply that lens, as it were. Conditioned, not me, mine. Or just life unfolding. And it's full of the understanding that we've already developed. And then we'll see if that understanding can drop into the being in a deeper way. So reflection, where we're really sort of thinking something through. Walking can be a great context for this. Vijayanandi was saying that's how she reflects, is with, with, with walking. So that rhythm of the walking can hold us in that reflecting. So then, the far end of the sort of spectrum conceptual, the really conceptual end, um, where we apply a reasoning process. And I think um, conceptual clarity sometimes gets a bad press, and we think, oh, it needs to be the heart and intuitive, and but actually it's also part of our being. And even in um, a quality like faith, Bhante draws out that actually there's, there's an element of of clear understanding in that, of conceptual conviction. Um, Just an element though, it's not the whole caboodle, but it can complement other aspects. So um, I've I've experimented with this and done some of these highly conceptual reasoning insight, Vipassana practices, and my experience was really interesting because mostly I did not enjoy the process. It felt like I was trying to, a bit like when I struggled with maths in school, I was sort of trying to bend my mind in a way that felt quite unpleasant. So I didn't really enjoy them. But there was a certain amount of clarity. And then what I found was that spontaneously, at a later point in meditation, ooh, something emerged out of that. So that's what I found. It, so sometimes those, yeah, those practices can be about um, getting clear that um, it's not actually logically possible for things to be separate, for example, for things to exist inherently, things to exist independently. It's not, it's not possible, it doesn't make any sense. And then seeing that can kind of reinforce the other kinds of knowing. 
bit of us that wants to be clearer. Stronger in some people than in others. Maybe not there at all. Some people might be quite happy to go with the, the intuitive, the heart knowing. Or So the general thing I want to bring in um, in relation to this aspect of um, integrating or assimilating, it's really repeating something I said before, but it's so important to remind at this point that um, acting as if the insight were fully known can help to integrate and assimilate it. So... <coughs> Actions, our actions arise out of our views, um, but then our actions also then colour our views, don't they? We keep acting with generosity, it has an effect on how we see the world. So actions and views, co-arising, leaning on each other. I've heard someone say, who I know seems to have a lot of deep, a deep, profound wisdom, that and a very important element for him in in that arising was general the practice of generosity. <coughs> I've been really interested in how um, the practice with the yidam, so sadhana practices, practices of evoking, imagining. Um, the Buddha, the Bodhisattvas, can be, a, it's related, it can be a kind of acting as if, both on and off the cushion, in the mind and in action. So I'm going to say a bit more about that um, probably tomorrow, tomorrow night. In a slightly different way, it's an acting as if. Also, Mike today was talking about how um, insight is often just much more simple and available than we tend to think. So, really knowing, for example, ready or not, someday I will die. To really know that is a transformative insight. And yeah, the very simple reflection that's often brought in when um, Metabhavna is being taught initially. Um, everyone wants to be happy and everyone suffers. So really, really knowing that is insight. To really, really know that. And that could come in d different ways. We really see, in an element of that might be that we just really see the conditionality of suffering and the conditionality of happiness in our own experience. We see what, how that works and how delusion and craving and aversion feed each other, co-arise. We really get that and then we know it has to be like that. Or we just see it is like that. And then when it comes to a neutral person in the Metabhavna, okay, we don't really we don't know the details of their life and their experience, but we know, we just know that they, they suffer and they really long to be happy. It's just known. It's, yeah, so it's, this is part of insight into Dukkha. So I wanted to go back to an exercise that we did yesterday and let's just do it a little bit more of it. So this was um, in the walking, the invitation to pay attention to space. So 
let's just settle and we'll just take a few minutes to do that. Noticing any effect from that, however subtle, in the heart, mind and the body. And we tend to ignore space. So, with, so just doing this with eyes open, so we're looking at the visual field when we feel ready. with a soft gaze So, what did you notice? Anyone? I noticed that the distinction between in here and out there became very blurred. Yeah. And the boundaries were all clear. Mm. That sense of the boundaries not clear yet, sense of between in here and out there, distinction, softening, mm-hmm. yeah, thank you. I felt a sort of increase in interest mm. and curiosity mm. that kept me kind of thinking. Yeah, that, yeah. yeah in, interest and curiosity. Began sort of exploring. where I could feel space in my body mm. as well as mm-hmm. corresponding to what I could see mm-hmm. in terms of distance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I felt kind of um, 
It wasn't in terms of circles and it wasn't in terms of kind of Chinese boxes, but I felt kind of space in me mm. and then a space in relation to space mm. between everyone here. Mm. And then outside a kind of almost like another world, a series of worlds. Mm. Um, space that is very open around us. Mm. I, and then I thought about the city and how important it was to develop and keep that mm. sense of, uh, mm. yeah, that space and so on. So that sense of space, what did that feel like? Well, visually inside me I have this kind of pool of water, so, which um, I have when I feel that space. Mm. Um, was it pleasant? Was it pleasurable? Yeah. It, was pleasurable. No, it was all pleasurable. It was mm. almost like multiple possibilities. Mm. It was like, yeah, seeing things through different lenses. Mm. Really. Sense of multiple possibilities. Yeah, I mean, it's not the same as other times I've kind of envisaged the same space in individuals. Mm. This mm. Was, was more of a kind of paying attention to space between. Mm. And yeah. I, my own space came in afterwards in a way. It was just... Um, being aware how much space we have here, I guess, as well. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. So, doing this yesterday, I also found that it was um, pleasurable and um, a sen- the sense of space. And then, so then, why? What's going on there? in contrast to what we're normally doing when we focus more on objects. So when we're looking at the space, there's less focus on objects, isn't there? We're looking at the space in between objects. So the more that we kind of make objects, defined, fixed and separate, the more we are making, at the same time, a subject. So if you think about a sort of extreme version of that, something is not really not wanted, we're very, very aversive to it. It could be any object, it could be a mind state, it could be a being, it could be a physical object. We don't like it, we don't want it. And then the sense of that thing, as a thing, becomes very sort of strong. It's sort of there at the center of our awareness. We're ignoring other things. And the sense of the me becomes very strong as well, the subject. The me that's not wanting, that's want, and that's wanting a different experience. So the aversion and the craving, it's always the flip side, those two. And craving and aversion, reverse sides of each other. So, you can see how the sense of the me and the other, the subject and the object, is like a co-arising. Those two things arise together. They, they kind of fabricate each other. The more we've got a sense of a thing, an object that we don't want or want, the stronger the me. So it's almost like that wanting and not wanting is making the me that wants and doesn't want. Craving and aversion, and then of course there's Dukkha, which co-arises with craving and aversion. And there's tightness in the body, which co-arises with dukkha and craving and aversion and a strong sense of self. And there's tightness in the mind space, which goes with, co-arises with all of those. <laughs> Tightening around that thing as a thing. So opposite conditionality, as in can arise when we're looking at the space between it's not this clinging onto things and pushing and pulling, wanting and not, or not wanting. And a sense of me can soften. 
as Aggie mentioned, that sense of this me, separation, body, it'll be a letting go in the body, a letting go in the mind space, moving more towards the the open mind, the skylight mind. Less separation, more freedom, heart can open. So maybe, and then all of that can come from the heart opening (laughs) as well. Heart opens, body opens, mind space opens, sense of me is less, sense of other is less, sense of separation is less. You can see all of that in metta. So maybe when that's happening, as well as just enjoying the kind of freedom of heart that happens, we can see clearly what's going on. And that that sense of separation is something that is fabricated. It's not actually something that's findable. We say it doesn't exist inherently. So there's something to look at when the heart is opening, in whatever way, seeing that, looking for for that, no real separation. When the separation's less, it's easier to see that. So, question, how do we know that insight is is going on, that that actually there's some shift whereby a new way of seeing is actually being really known, that there's a a real knowing and seeing outside of our normal grooves. In the moment, we can feel that in the body and in the heart-mind. So if, for example, just using one of the examples I was talking about earlier, so, you know, something arises and we and we just note it's just life unfolding it's not something I need to think of as me and mine maybe we just say life life unfolding here that can have a resonance in the body that can have an effect a letting go in the body a letting go and opening in the mind it might be very subtle we might miss it but when that happens, we can really know that something has gone in, in that moment, because the body wouldn't be responding and letting go otherwise. The body doesn't just sort of, like, you know. It's because something has actually been realized. There's some sense of, oh, I don't need to hold on so tightly. Because something's been known and seen. So we've got another another kind of virtuous cycle or co-arising going on here. So we talked about how with meta meta can give rise to samadhi and then the samadhi and samadhi gives can give rise to meta. So same thing with insight. Something seen and known. As a freeing up in the heart mind, in the body, as a letting go. That can feed into 
a samadhi. So we, Mike today was talking about, you know, the classic thing is that samadhi gives rise to, allows or integrates insight. But then it's also the other way around as well. That these moments of freeing up can allow us, can take us into absorption. And maybe when something, there's a moment of clarity, of whatever kind, of, just really give that space. Notice the effect of that in the body. Just rest in that. So, yeah, um, the last bit I wanted to talk about, I just wanted to share a couple of um, meta insight lenses, which are based on reflection. Actually, one of them we'll do, just one we're going to do, we'll do now. Um, so the other one I'll bring in later, the other one's around bringing that lens of conditionality to seeing others. So, one we'll do now. So, in Metabhavna, sometimes it's suggested that when we are finding it hard with someone who's we've got difficulty with, fourth stage person, we might imagine how somebody else would see that person. We might imagine how would their mum see them, or how would a dear friend see them, or how would the Buddha see them, or Padmasambhava. And that can help loosen something, can't it? It Loosen this kind of um, fixity in our own view based on our own particular experience can give a sense of "Mm, I'm holding on to this way of perceiving this person and this narrative about them and they did this and it hurt me and, and we're widening out the frame and acknowledging that actually this person is much bigger than that much bigger than that. Other people see them in entirely different ways, have very different narrative. So I found it really helpful to take this a little bit deeper into a kind of insight way of looking. By reflecting that with any being there are so many perceptions So any of us here, we've got our our self-perception and then we're perceived differently by every other being. So each of us here will be perceived differently by each of us here. Independence on conditions. And then to go even wider, it's not like we just have one perception, is it? Perception changes, heart-mind changes, we see that person differently in each moment, actually. So all these different perceptions, which is the correct one? People are smiling. It's because we know that's ridiculous, don't we? Actually, there isn't a correct one. So, what does that mean for what that person thought is, for who we are? Where are we to be found amidst all of that?
So this brings in how everything's arising out of conditions. And one of the major conditions is the perceiving consciousness, heart mind. I'm going to leave you with that one and you might like to take that into the walking. Each tree perceived differently by each being in each moment. Where's the tree then?